Hello, friends. Welcome to my channel if you are new here. My name is Julie and I'm the author of the blog CapturingWinterland.com. Let us talk about antique and vintage furniture. Basically the do's and do nots when you are buying furniture for your home or even you could use this advice also when you're looking to sell or um, purchase it as a business to sell. I have my notes. And I am tucked in because this is like the coldest day we've had in a very long time. And I'm freezing. So let's just get straight into these do's and don'ts. I have four do's, four do nots. <laughs> do not, do not for you today. And then later on, after I'm done with that, I'm gonna go into some questions about why I think that you should purchase vintage and antique furniture and some common questions about antiques and vintage that you might have as well. Without further ado, the do's, these are things that you can definitely feel good about when you say yes to these. So this basically is a guideline that I have come up with after about 15 years of buying, refinishing, and even selling furniture as a hobby side business, and also sometimes really regretting my decisions. So I have made pretty much all the mistakes that you could make when buying um, and refinishing furniture. So I've made the mistakes so you don't have to. And just so you are warned, like, okay, sometimes I don't follow my own rules. And that is sometimes when I <laughs> receive some really um, interesting situations where I get way over my head um, for our projects. The French, the French server that I just recently did, and I will link that if you haven't seen it, was a huge project <laughs> that required a lot because it was one piece of furniture that, according to my guidelines, you, I, I should not have purchased. But it turned out really good in the end. But that's only because I feel like I had you guys to hold me accountable. So. The do number one, inspect your furniture before you buy it. Scrutinize each piece and test it out. Super important. Please do not buy furniture that you can't actually use in your home. <laughs> unless it's like super cheap and you can't fix it and then you're gonna turn around and sell it or whatever. So before you purchase it, use it as it's supposed to function. So if you buy a chair, sit in it. If you buy a couch, sit in it, lay in it, all the things. And you want to be feeling for stability of the piece of furniture like how well is the frame holding up? Bounce around in it a little bit, get get kind of crazy. Pick it up because you wanna see, are the arms wobbly or like has the frame been compromised at all? You wanna test all of those things. And also you wanna know if this piece of furniture is actually comfortable. I have bought some really beautiful pieces of furniture that ultimately were just not comfortable pieces of furniture to use. They're gorgeous to just have sitting around in your home, but if you're actually wanting to use them for their purpose, maybe not the best choice. So if it's a dresser or a side table or basically anything with drawers, you wanna make sure to open and close the drawers and so that you can tell if it's, there's any problems. Are the drawers falling apart? Are, I mean, are they wobbly? Are the drawer slides missing? Or are the little um, side things on the inside, like take the drawers out, are they missing? Those are easy to replace, but you know, depending on who you are, you may not want to do that. So scrutinize it. Here are some more questions that you can ask when you're looking at furniture and you know, squinting at it and be like, should I take you home? E are you worth it? Is it missing hardware? And if that matters to you or not, does it have a bad paint job that you are then going to have to spend hours removing? Some pieces of furniture, I did a <laughs> an antique, empire uh, secretary desk for my uh, youngest son. And while it turned out absolutely gorgeous, it was a beast because it had had at like six or seven layers of paint. And if you didn't see that project, I'm gonna go ahead and link that up here too because you should totally watch it. It was, I mean, night and day, you wouldn't have even recognized the first piece to the, to the last. And he absolutely loves that desk, but it was so much work. So if it's got a bad paint job, you might rethink it because it might just not be as simple as putting on a fresh clean coat. Sometimes you really just have to take it down 
to wood to get that clean look that you're looking for. Will it be safe for guests to use in your home? Um, take into account larger people in your home or people that like to plop down on furniture. I bought these really cute vintage chairs that were more mid-century back when I was in that phase of my life. And um, the legs were a tiny bit wobbly and I didn't think much about it because I personally know how to sit properly in a chair and not plop. Well, I had my dad over and he plopped and um, he broke the chairs, like the legs out from underneath it, like just totally disassembled the chair. So that was kind of embarrassing. <laughs> Embarrassing for me, embarrassing for him. I'm sure nobody wants to come to your home and break your furniture. So let's just be conscientious about purchasing quality furniture that's actually safe to be used. Yeah, so just be aware of the flaws before you hand money over. It could, you could still want it, but then anything that you notice is wrong about it or missing, especially if it wasn't mentioned in any ad advertisement or whatever, if you're buying this off like Facebook or something like that, you can then haggle with the price and be like, you know what, it's missing all of its original hardware. You know, would you take this much money? Or, hey, I noticed that these drawers are not in great condition. That wasn't mentioned. Now I'm thinking I want to drop the price $20 or whatever, you know, because it's going to take me time to fix it. So when you're aware of these things, then you can come back and kind of have a little bit of wiggle room maybe. Number two, do buy pieces in good solid condition. So pretty much what we just talked about. I would add to this to not to be afraid to walk away. Do not fall so hopelessly madly in love with something that you get blinders for all of the flaws and the problems and be completely unrealistic about it. Even if you went out of your way to meet someone to purchase a piece, sometimes the flaws are absent in the advertisement or they're kind of bluffed a little bit. So the biggest point to take away of this, again, is to be just be aware of things. And if it hints of instability and you're not up for the project, just tell them. I mean, it's kind of sucks, but at the same time, it's better to be realistic and not haul something all the way home and then for it to sit in your garage or something and then end up being like in your garage sale a couple months later. That's not good for our wallets or our minds because I know having pieces like that, I know for me personally, I feel guilty having them in my home because I'm like, oh my gosh, I spent money on this. Like, <laughs> and then I, I feel like, oh my gosh, I need to, to fix this piece of furniture and then they pile up and then I'm like, I have, 15 pieces of furniture to refinish and yeah so <laughs> just don't do it walk away from it if it if it's beyond what you want Number three, do shop with dimensions in hand. This is so valuable. Keep a tiny little measuring tape in your purse or a sewing tape, those little foldable ones in your wallet if you're a guy, keep it on hand for you. We all have those weird wonky spaces in our home that are kind of awkward and Sometimes you just know that something needs to go there, but you're not entirely sure what, or you need a dresser and you have this one weird spot, like in my um, entryway there. It's super narrow right there, but I needed something to help me keep track of shoes and hats and gloves and all that stuff. So when I was looking for a piece of furniture to go there, I had to, to make sure that it would fit in that space. So keep the measurements on hand and keep something that you can also measure the pieces that you're looking at with you, like a measuring tape. You might find something that you love and you just don't wanna walk away from it and then you buy it and then you haul it all the way home and then you get it into the space and it's like one inch or two inches off. Then your husband might be upset at you because he had to help you get it off the roof rack of the car and then haul it up the stairs and ask me how I know this. <laughs> Number four, do know what a piece is worth. And again, super valuable, especially if you are shopping on a small budget like I am. Especially if you are looking for a particular piece. For example, I had this epiphany one day when I was scrolling through Facebook Marketplace that I was looking for side table options, something that I like to look for antiques that that are were meant for a purpose back when they were made that just no longer basically have that purpose anymore. Like they're not useful anymore in today's world. So when I got my eye on these Martha Washington 
sewing cabinets. I was like, these are absolutely gorgeous pieces of furniture and like nobody uses sewing cabinets anymore. I mean, I would have to say for the most part, if you're into sewing, you're gonna have to use something way bigger than that tiny little thing. But it has the perfect amount of space for a side table. It has three little drawers, which hold plenty of stuff, and then two larger side cases that are great for um, extra storage for things. So they are perfect for side tables. Well, I was able to figure out that in my area, they ran about 100 to $150. Now, knowing that is super valuable because then when you find one, for 40 or $50, which is what I paid for both of mine, you can snap them up and be confident that you got a really great deal on them, as well as if later on you decide that they don't work or you want to sell them, you're already ahead of the game because you've paid a fraction of the cost that what they typically go for, and you can go ahead and resell them and actually make a profit off of them. So that's one thing that I have done time and time again over and over again. Every piece of furniture that I have purchased for my home was so inexpensive. When I went, when I got to that point where I was like, okay, I don't really need this anymore. I don't want it. Or I want to replace it with something else or different and my style changes. I turn around and I sell it and I make a profit every single time. So not only am I getting the use of the object for however many years, but I'm also getting all of my money back out of it and then some. So smart. That's a smart way to do it. The don'ts. <laughs> now, you might get yourself into trouble with these, but just uh, just to be honest and forthright here, it, <laughs> um, I have been known, once again, to disregard my own rules. So it's up to you. You're bound to mess up at some point. We all make mistakes. So especially like if it's a piece of furniture that you're just like in love with and you don't listen to your little voice in your head that says, this is probably not a good idea. So at least you can avoid some pitfalls if you heed this advice most of the time. Number one, do not buy pieces with damages beyond your skill level. Be realistic, okay? So if you want to buy a table set like I did at a garage sale, I paid $75 for my entire table set in my dining room, the, the antique table and the six chairs, but all of the chairs needed reupholstering. That is a beginner level project. Definitely super easy. Anybody can do that. However, don't go falling in love with an antique sofa that needs a complete repulsory job because then you might find yourself in a position a year later where it's sitting and you paid $150 for it and you're probably gonna have to pay a couple thousand to get it reupholstered by an actual professional. <laughs> I, you know, I don't know who I could be talking about, but one of these days I will have to pay someone to reupholster that because it is a true historic piece and I bought it from the original family. It was her great grandparents couch and they purchased it straight from the store. So I feel a duty to do right by it. So maybe one of these days I will take upholstery classes. It's been my dream to do that. But at this point, it's just sitting there. $150 is sitting downstairs and I can't do anything about it. And so that's a lot of money when you're working on a small budget. So listen to me, heed take lesson from my poor choices. Number two, do not purchase upholstered pieces that smell funky. Definitely. If, if do a smell test with all of the furniture, wood included, especially if there's any kind of water damage, you wanna make sure that there is not also mold. So smell pieces for mildew and mold and um, definitely, for cigarette smoke, especially if you're a non-smoker and that kind of stuff bothers you. If you have like sensitive nostrils like I do, I am very sensitive to smells. If there is a hint of mold or mildew on something, I can smell it from like a mile away and my skin starts to get itchy because I'm actually allergic to mold. Stick your face in it, guys. You wanna know, does it smell? Did they have animals? Because if it smells like 
cat urine or dog pee, it's a good hard pass, especially if it's upholstered, because there are parts of furniture that you most definitely can clean, especially if you have a little, a little mini Bissell that I do, and I often steam clean furniture when I bring it into my home. But you cannot clean all of the cushions and stuff. So if it's been peed on by an animal or something like that, then just you want to know ahead of time. So smell it and make sure that it's not going to offend you. Number three, don't buy vintage furniture that is made of laminate or pressed wood. This might be controversial. Some people love certain types of furniture from the 50s and the 60s and they really got into laminate and stuff like that and even vintage retro furniture with um, pressed wood. It's it's junk, guys. You don't want to do it. And I would have to say not this doesn't apply for just antique or vintage furniture. Antique furniture they didn't use laminate and they didn't use pressed wood. So you don't have to worry about that. But vintage and retro furniture they most definitely did and they are lower quality pieces. They're easy to break and easy to damage and almost impossible to repair. So I would just not do it. Um, this goes also for those assembly line pieces of furniture where you actually have to put them together yourself. And this is coming from somebody that has purchased Ikea furniture in the past and then learned the mistake of my ways. They do have some solid wood pieces of furniture, but then they have stuff that's basically cardboard garbage. So steer clear of that. Don't waste your money. Put your money towards a solid wood piece of vintage or antique furniture that is going to last you forever. And if you, if you are not the one that wants it forever, then at least you have that to resell and it still has its value versus purchasing a Billy bookcase for, I don't even know how much they go for anymore. And then you try to move it and it breaks and then all it is is firewood. Number four. Don't purchase furniture that has safety recalls on it. And this basically goes for vintage or antique baby cribs or the like. There are some other items, um, but they wouldn't be vintage or antique. Things along the baby route that I definitely wouldn't buy, like mattresses. I wouldn't buy those used because again, there's no real way to clean them. Car seats, again, you can never tell if it's been in an accident or all of that stuff, all of that good stuff. But with cribs, it's actually illegal to buy and sell drop down cribs. And there are a lot of safety concerns when it comes to like the width between the bars and stuff like that. However, I have purchased vintage and antique cribs before as pieces because the, um, they make some really cool stuff. Like their ends, I have used the ends of cribs to make um, chalkboards before because they're just, they're beautiful pieces of furniture. It's just, they can't be used safely any longer for what they were intended for. But that's actually my wheelhouse because I love buying furniture and trying to use it in a way that it wasn't intended for. So that's my do's and don'ts. I'm sure there's actually a lot more and I would, I plan on doing a video helping you decipher what certain types of repairs for furniture would be considered like beginner, like skill level kind of stuff. So beginner, intermediate, and skilled. Like you know what you're doing, you're comfortable doing it. So look for that video coming up soon. These are only four of many points. I could, I could probably talk endlessly about why you should, but these are the top four. Number one, the value of an antique. The antiques hold their value for many reasons, but they hold their value mostly because they are good quality, much better quality and made of better materials than what typical furniture you will buy in big box store are made of these days. All of that stuff is garbage, but don't care how pretty it looks, it's garbage, as well as how they were made. So the craftsmanship of the pieces was the, I mean, the standards for how they put things together and the materials that they used and even how like practices that they used in making them is just so inferior today than what it was 50 or 100 years ago. So, and for furniture value, you can typically purchase a vintage or antique piece and a more affordable price range than you would for a comparable piece that's new. So for instance, this, French sideboard that I recently did that I mentioned earlier, I paid $160 for this piece of furniture. And then I turned around and I spent almost no money. Obviously I spent lots of time 
on it but I spent almost no money making it what it is right now. And if I were to try to purchase a piece of furniture that looks like this, I would be paying upwards of four and $5,000, maybe even more. If you were to try to purchase something that looks like this new, you'd be paying thousands of dollars versus the $160 that I paid. Number two, the higher quality. Again, the general rule, antique furniture is made with better materials and it always has good bones. So really good structure, unique designs, the way that they put their furniture together and things that they incorporated in them, like these rounded off hidden drawers on the side of this and the rounded off cabinet doors. And in secretary desks, they have hidden things and um, almost like a, uh, one of those puzzle boxes. They, they put so much thought into their furniture back then and they're just designs are timeless what is beautiful 50 and 100 years ago is still beautiful today and it will still be beautiful when your grandchildren are getting it from you so these are heritage pieces they're gonna outlive a lot of people so <laughs> you know they're they're worth it number three is the thrill of the hunt the thing about buying antique and vintage furniture is it is old it's historic so it is in, it's rare, it's in short quantity. The pieces that you find, you may, you may find a piece that you will never ever find again. You'll never see it again. And that is because so much of it has been destroyed. So much of it has been ruined by people and just not taken care of or stored in places and then it degrades and falls apart. I'm always binge watching those videos on YouTube or whatever, um, the decay is what they like to call it. And these abandoned mansions with this absolutely gorgeous furniture. And I just wish that I could go in there and salvage it all because all of that is history that's just being destroyed. I mean, I wish I had the money to salvage the houses and the chateaus and the castles too, but you know, <laughs> maybe just the furniture. <laughs> um, so it's a challenge and it's fun. It, it is an adventure. And every piece of furniture I have ever owned, I loved while I owned it. And um, I was absolutely giddy and excited when, it, when I brought it into my home. Number four, the versatility each piece has. You don't have to use a dresser just for clothes. I actually use a dresser over here for shoes. The dresser in my dining room actually holds all of my tools. So it hides all of the ugliness that I don't want people to see in a very um, convenient and beautiful way, stylish. You can also use dressers as bathroom vanities if you don't mind doing that. You can use washstands for that. You can use washstands for side tables. You can use buffets or sideboards and servers. They don't have to be just for the dining room. They actually make really great entertainment consoles, dressers, vanities. Basically, any way that you can find a use for them they can be that and they are just so versatile and they're beautiful no matter where you put them. So think outside the box when you are purchasing them and I bet you will find that you love them even more when you find a use for something that is outdated almost or forgotten by history. Best places to look for antique and vintage furniture. The um, correct answer for this would be literally anywhere. My eyeballs are always like looking on the hunt. <laughs> so I have gotten furniture from curbs, dumpsters, freebies that people have given to me. There's no wrong answer, but if you are specifically looking and you need to have a piece of furniture for something soon, the best places to look are antique shops, estate sales, online marketplaces like Facebook, Craigslist, OfferUp, Mercari, LetGo, flea markets and antique markets, thrift stores, local auction houses and garage sales or yard sales. Those are all the best places to look. If you've got garage sale season coming up, well, I mean, we all do. So, you know, be on the lookout. Is it worth buying vintage and antique furniture? The benefits of buying, I have already list several, but they have timeless style. They're also made very well and less expensive compared to new furniture will last another 50 to 100 years if you take care of it properly. So yes, 
it is worth buying them. How to choose antique furniture. Inspect the frame and the hardware. Look for mark maker's marks, which could be a signature, could be an actual paper label that is stapled to the back of it, or inside of the drawers a lot of times you will find a maker's mark. So be aware of any damage and assess what is easily repaired or an extensive project. And also understand pieces with more extensive damage may need to be completely refinished, which might actually ultimately ruin the value. So if you're looking at a higher price piece and it needs extensive work, take that into consideration when you are deciding on a price to pay for it. What is the difference between vintage furniture and antique furniture? Simply put, Antique is anything that is 100 years or older. Vintage is anything 20 to 100 years. So vintage and retro could be as early as 20 years ago, which is insane because I'm 38. So I'm like vintage, I'm retro. How can you tell if furniture is antique? These are seven things to definitely pay attention to. Dovetailed joints, is it hand cut? or machine cut. Machine cut will obviously be very symmetrical, very clean, standard cut. Hand cut will be obviously much more sloppy. I, I mean, I don't wanna say sloppy. They were still pretty good at doing what they did, but you'll definitely be able to tell. Different types of wood is actually a good sign. Solid wood drawer bottoms versus plywood. Look for a maker's mark, like I mentioned. Dowels, if it's got dowels when it was being put together, like it's coming apart and you can see dowels, then it may not be an antique. Another good indicator is saw marks and tool marks. Screws or nail heads. Now, if you find a piece of furniture that has only flat head screws and they look like they're all a little bit different in sizes, like they're not super conformed, that's a good indicator that you probably have at least older vintage piece and maybe even an antique piece. Even if it's a piece of furniture that was made to look like another era of furniture, it still might be an antique. What type of wood is most antique furniture? So before the 1700s, furniture was made with mostly oak. But from the 1700s and on, mahogany and Walmart were very prevalent. In America, pine is popular because of its cost and ease of use. So that's a very common piece of wood, like type of wood that you will see in older pieces of furniture as well. However, high quality furniture would have been made of more expensive hardwoods. So you got maple, oak, walnut, cherry, or mahogany. What types of furniture have the best investment value? I would have to say any area of your house, like the furniture that you use in the areas of your house that gets the most use is the place where you should invest the most in the furniture to make sure that you're getting quality pieces that will stand up to long, hard use. So furniture like couches and lounge chairs for your living room or your dining table and chair set and even your beds and dressers should probably be the place where you are investing the, um, the most money or I mean, not really even. So most of my dressers were like $50. So we're not talking high amounts of money, but you definitely want to, I would say, focus more heavily on ensuring that those pieces of furniture are good quality versus some other stuff that may not get as much use. So guys, that is all I have for today. But like I said, I am working on more great content. I actually have a series of videos coming up that I'm doing a collaboration with a dear friend on, and it's going to be a small entryway makeover. So get excited, I'm excited. I can't even tell you how excited I am. And I also have more work coming in my daughter's bedroom as well as furniture makeover projects. So also if you have ideas for content that you would like me to make questions that you would like me to answer about any of the content that I typically show or whatever, go ahead and feel free to leave that for me in the comments section below. I would love to hear from you. I'm always looking for more great content ideas and definitely stuff that you guys want to see. So thank you so much guys for watching all the way through, all the way through. <laughs> Do not forget to please give this video a like and subscribe if you aren't and would love to see more content like this. And um, I'll talk to you later in the next one.
All right, guys. Bye. Thank you.